Hello, and welcome to this office session on the future of money market funds, which over the past 50 years have become an integral part of global capital markets, but are now subject to regulatory review. And just how appropriate and well-informed that review is will be core to our discussion today. One of the perennial problems of financial regulation is that policymakers, perhaps inevitably, look at issues of the past when they're attempting to review the framework to avoid potential pressure points in the future. And if those past issues are not properly understood by the policymakers, then a very real concern arises that any new measures will have negative consequences for the markets while not correcting the identified vulnerabilities. OMFIF has conducted a thorough review of what happened in the money markets in March 2020 at the height of an economic crisis caused by a global pandemic. And whether the current ideas mooted by a host of national and international policymakers to fix money market funds would have the desired impact. We've spoken to a wide range of industry participants, former policymakers, market regulators, lawyers and academics, and taken on board their views. And the paper that we are previewing today, The Future of Money Market Funds, is the result of that research and can be downloaded via our website at www.onfif.org. There is clearly a disconnect between how policymakers view money market funds and what the funds themselves believe to be the issues at play in the markets in which they operate. At the very least, this demands a period of constructive dialogue between the parties. And that's what this paper aims to encourage and facilitate. Such a dialogue would avoid a rush to judgment about a financial market segment that plays an important role for companies in reducing their borrowing costs and for investors in diversifying their exposures and increasing their returns. The truth appears to be that MMFs have performed robustly and proved their resilience through two seismic financial crises. The industry participants are clearly ready and willing to engage in these discussions. They agree, for example, that concerns about liquidity and secondary money markets are justified. However, they rightly point out that this is an issue for the market as a whole, rather than just money market funds, and that policymakers need to adopt a holistic approach. ONFIF believes that organizations such as the President's Working Group in the US, the European Securities and Markets Authority in the EU, and the Financial Stability, Stability Board internationally they're considering proposals such as capital buffer requirements, minimum balance at risk or swing pricing requirements, which either address problems that don't exist or make money market funds far less able to fulfill their core role. And the danger is that investors will seek alternative and perhaps systemically riskier alternatives. I hope that sets the scene for our discussion, but now it's time to hear from our experts. And first I'd like to go to David Freeman, a partner at Arnold at Porter, uh, and an expert in this field to give us an overview of the issues at hand. David, how did you see the industry respond immediately after and during the COVID-19 pandemic? And please, could you offer your thoughts on the regulator's response? So uh, the first thing I'd point out is this was not a crisis in the money market industry or the, or the money market uh, markets themselves, or even the financial system as a whole. This was a pandemic um, that hit the economy fast and hard. And as anything of this nature, it's going to have an impact on the markets generally, and money markets are not exempt from that. And money market funds as a participant in the money market uh, in, uh, markets are not exempt from that. So as um, people started pulling back from the markets, you did see stress in the markets um, starting in February uh, 2020, which spilled over through oil and equities and bonds and treasuries and ultimately last to hit was the money markets, these very short term high quality debt instruments. So the money market funds as a participant in that, and they're not by any means the largest participant, um, met the needs of their investors as they operate normally. Um, they hold a tremendous amount of liquid assets. Um, they're required to hold 10% daily liquid and 30% <clears throat> weekly liquid assets. And they use that to meet redemptions as needed by their investor clients. And so during the crisis, you see, as often happens in this kind of market turmoil, people are looking for cash. And the investors, particularly institutional investors, started putting redemptions in, um, in the middle of March. So well into the, into the uh, normal uh, part of the crisis, you had uh, demands on cash. And the money funds met those redemptions by dipping into liquidity reserves. Um, their redemptions were 
to meet those demands and money was moved into government money market funds for the most part. Um, and you saw the government step in um, to provide liquidity across all segments of the industry. So this is the Federal Reserve opened up, um, I don't know, eight or 10 different emergency financing facilities, which they have authority to do, and they do very well, I must say. And they had them for municipal governments. They had them for corporate issuers. They had them for a whole range of different types of borrowers. And among those many types was the money market as a whole, none of them were extending credit. None of the Fed facilities extended credit directly to money funds. They extended credit to issuers of commercial paper. These are the businesses, the ultimate borrowers, to make sure they had access to keep operating, keep meeting payroll, that sort of thing. Uh, and the Fed also provided credit to banks and broker dealers that bought commercial paper off money funds to provide a secondary market liquidity as needed. And this was on March 17th, they set up those for two particular facilities. Um, and they worked as they, as they were expected to do, and they provide liquidity for those markets, not necessarily just for money funds, but for the markets as a whole. And that worked out quite well, as did the other uh, programs that the Fed set up. Um, at the same time, the federal banking regulators in the U.S. put a lot of pressure on the banks to ease up on their credit to their commercial borrowers, to make sure there was cash available to businesses to meet payroll, to make their rent, to make, do all the things that the business needs to do to keep afloat. And the concern there was banks otherwise might be encouraged to rein in to address the risk in those loans. And the banking agencies encourage them to keep that money flowing, to borrow from the Federal Reserve to the banks to make those loans happen if needed. And that all worked beautifully. And I got to say, the, the Fed and the other banking agencies did a great job of making sure there's liquidity in the economy to keep it afloat. And that was excellent. Um, but it, it's a, an economic situation as a whole. It's not really about money funds. Um, and I thought they did, the regulators did a good job managing the crisis. And then finally, Congress stepped in and pumped about a trillion and a half dollars in, in essentially grant money to the affected small businesses, hotel industry, restaurant industry, the airline industry. Um, and this was money that was essentially forgiven if they used it to make rent and payroll. Um, which is an extraordinary thing. But when you look at all this cash flowing into the market, um, it, it worked and it did keep the economy afloat, avoided a, a meltdown of the economy. And I, you know, I have nothing but praise for that. But to relabel that as about money funds, it's just, it's just not accurate. Was, was, was the bounce back in money market funds after those interventions, was that proof of concept that there's nothing structurally fundamentally flawed with the money market funds themselves? Yes. Now, the drawdown in late March and April was, I think, around 30 percent and in the prime space, not so much in the government space, which sort of offset almost, you know, to even the whole thing out as a whole. Um, but it did bounce back in May and got, got to where it had been previously. Um, and so I think it does show that investors feel very comfortable with money funds. Thank you, David. Um, that certainly um, kicks off our discussion. And, and this is not a US only issue. It's certainly something that other regulators are looking at well. So, so now we will we'll have uh, some words from Stefan Kurd. And Stefan is the head of risk analysis an economics department at ESMA, which is one of the regulators looking at money market fund industry and which launched the consultation process in March this year. Stefan, what is your thinking in terms of the role of money market funds going forward? And were there specific challenges that the crisis in 2020 presented for money market funds or were these in line, as David was suggesting, in line with financial services as a whole during an unprecedented lockdown of the global economy? Thank you, Clive. And let me, first of all, thank you for inviting us uh, to share our views uh, in this matter. You just mentioned our consultation coming up. Um, we are very uh, eager to have a close dialogue with market participants uh, in the ecosystem of money market funds around it, uh, short-term funding market, to actually fully understand the mechanics of what happened uh, last year. And um, whether and to what extent uh, things needed, need to be done. And of course, as regulator supervisors, we naturally take a very strong interest in what happened last year. Um, this is across all levels, and levels national, uh, in particular national authorities, the European level, which I represent, 
but also the discussions that we have uh, in IOSCO and the FSB. So there is a very strong interest in the matter, but also a strong interest in having the uh, and good understanding, a solid understanding of what is going on. In a market, let's face it, that is extremely large. It's a 1.2 trillion euros market in the European Union, which is very sizable. And it is a market where within just over 10 years, uh, authorities had to intervene twice in order to uh, prevent um, uh, additional risks, what at least at the time were considered to be ad additional risks. Um, we are particularly as regulators, uh, supervisors, concerned about the money, ma market fund, uh, money market fund market in as far as it is a very central part of the financial system. It interlinks with a number of markets around it uh, and it provides very, very important short-term funding to banks and corporates. Let's not forget about this, that um, money market funds hold uh, a quarter trillion of uh, CPs and CDs uh, of uh, Euro area banks. Um, and this is a very large market footprint. The financial market footprint is 40 to 50%. This is a very sizable uh, presence of the money market fund industry. And inversely, the investors of money market funds are predominantly corporates, yes, but also investment funds and insurance companies by a very large margin who in investing in money market funds, trust and rely on MMFs to offer stable value and redeemability at, at very short notice. And this, is, this takes us to one of the key problems that we see in the market. We saw significant stress, and this is why we're taking this very strong interest. Uh, on the liability side, redemptions uh, in March 2020 were massive. LVNAFs in the European Union lost minus 20%. So between the 11th and the 25th of March, 120 billion of euros, VNAVs 6%, and conversely, of course, constant net asset value funds uh, gained 55% in the same period, right? So we can see that there was a lot of dynamics going on driven by liquidity needs of investors uh, and the inability of corporates uh, to issue a CP as well as margin calls and so on. So uh, on the liability side, there was stress. And on the asset side, uh, we saw the liquidity um, in the CP markets going down, a lack of trades, and in the end, a shutdown of CP and CDD markets in terms of issuance, right? And these two sides together, of course, put money market funds into a very difficult situation um, that can be described as acute stress. Now, a central part of this is, of course, the le weekly liquid asset limit of 30%, um, where uh, a number of money market funds uh, you know, can close or even actually breaching that limit um, at a certain points in time, uh, and which in, in turn in the European Union um, gets them to the point where they need to decide uh, and consider redemption fees and gates, right? The decision that, as, uh, that money market fund managers then need to take is um, they need to meet their redemptions. And one option that they have is sell weekly liquid assets, which gets them into the area of breaching the 30% limit. Or the other option is to sell assets, which, in that, which then in turn, especially for LVNAFs, um, gets them to the point where market to market losses will result in large net asset value deviations with the risk of then converting to a VNAF status, right? So these two things together, um, got money market funds in a situation where we as regulators, supervisors say that was extraordinary and certainly not in that sense comparable to what we saw elsewhere in the, in the asset management industry. And true, in that period, uh, asset management investment funds, all of them had to face very challenging market conditions. But what we see here put money market funds in a situation that was quite different from it. So the risks and policy issues that we need to consider is first of all, the resilience of the money market funds themselves. Um, in particular, considering that the commercial paper market is inherently illiquid, even in normal times, and the money market funds need to, need to be able to raise cash, even in stress times. Um, and secondly, it is also about the interconnectedness. Investors use money market funds uh, for insuring them, if you, if you want, against liquidity needs in times of stress. And uh, they, with that, they play um, um, not, not an overtly sizable, but critical role in funding markets for banks and non-financial corporations. Um, so the question that we, uh, as public authorities, need to ask ourselves is how can we, or can generally speaking in cooperation, of course, with the industry itself, the resilience 
and the liquidity of money market funds be increased uh, in order to mitigate system-wide risks and prevent what is um, what would then be in future a third time of authorities intervening. So this should not happen, considering not least that both on the US side and in the, uh, in, on the European side after the great global financial crisis uh, to more than 12 years ago, um, the regulatory systems were actually adapted uh, and revamped in pr a pretty large scale in order to avoid stresses of this type. So this is what motivates us and we're looking into these issues. Thank you very much. Back to you, Clive. Thank you. Thank you, Stefan. And, and, and thanks for those words. And I'm sure I'm sure the industry will appreciate that you want to engage in a constructive dialogue with them about this. I suppose one should always say that, that, that a review does not necessarily mean that it will lead immediately to change as well. Um, and, 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 and that ESMA and other regulators have an open mind um, as they're considering the markets. But, but I think now is a good, turn, good time to turn to Debbie Cunningham. And Debbie is the Chief Investment Officer of Global Money Markets at Federated Hermes, which is a money market fund whose constructive approach has been of great help in researching this report. Debbie, uh, having heard from what Stefan has said just there, um, within the industry, if there was a particular thing that you would want regulators to take account of, what would that be? Well, thank you, Clive, and uh, I appreciate the opportunity to speak with you here today through UMFIF. I think the most important thing for our uh, industry going forward would be looking for improvement uh, in the broader, high quality, short term asset market from a secondary market liquidity standpoint. Stefan mentioned it, um, it was mentioned by Dave at the very beginning. Um, but for various reasons, that secondary market liquidity in what are generally very high quality short term assets um, became a little bit dysfunctional. Some of those reasons would include regulatory impediments um, for the market makers to hold those assets during this stressful time, a, a broader and larger amount of those assets. Um, concerns from a shareholder standpoint about the economic shutdown, what that would do to the industries. Um, as uh, Stefan mentioned, it's for the, a, large, a large portion of the industry is uh, dominated by investments from corporations and various industries, various sectors. What would the shutdown impact be to those sectors? So, you know, erring on the side of caution by trying to have as much liquidity as possible. And, you know, I think probably their need to turn these the most easily redeemable assets into cash was pretty high. So that would be money market funds. And when you look at money market funds as a participant in the broader high quality short-term asset uh, mix, they are a significant, but not majority um, uh, participant in those markets. And normally um, the, the sector from a money market fund standpoint is buy and hold. Uh, generally speaking, if we are repositioning our portfolio for maybe a longer duration, shorter duration, you know, more barbelled, more laddered, um, we look to secondary market makers from a liquidity standpoint for helping us to do that. And generally speaking, we have very good results. Um, dealers tend to make programs or to make liquidity um, in their the programs where they are a named dealer um, or from a standpoint of the banking sector with their own paper, their own name. So that's a good thing in most normal situations, but this wasn't a normal situation and that's not what occurred in March of 2021. Instead, you saw, you know, bid ass spreads that you could drive a truck through basically, um, trading by what I'd call appointment only uh, you know, it would take basically a full day to execute maybe a single sell in the marketplace and uncertainties from a bank's balance sheet standpoint as to just, just how much they had available to lend, if you will, in this secondary market by buying paper. So, you know, we've tried to think through what would have helped this situation and basically our um, uh, you know, the, the result of our analysis would be having direct interaction between the potential buyers and the sellers in the market. And so we're specifically talking about secondary market trades. Um, there are various such systems in the market, trade rev, boom, other um, European systems that allow dealers and buyers to interact, but don't necessarily allow issuers 
and investors or, or sellers and buyers to interact um, or buyers and buyers because it was not the entire part of the commercial paper industry from an investor standpoint that was experiencing the amount of liquidity drain on their asset base as it was in money market funds. So being able to interact with them more directly on a, on a owner to owner basis without having to go through the constraints of the bank, bank and the broker dealer balance sheets would have been something I think that would have incentivized um, and, and, you know, improved the market liquidity at that point in time and maybe you know caused a little bit more normalization from a bid ask spread standpoint. So for those reasons, we think focusing on you know maybe maybe some changes from a um, uh, you know a, a, a gate, gates and fees linkage type of, of connectivity with the money market funds themselves, but also improving um, the interconnectedness of the market participants is where we're focusing most of our efforts. Thank you, Debbie. And, 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 and that would be so that you would encourage regulators, therefore, to look at the market as a whole if they're looking at this and not to narrowly focus on one subset of the market. Absolutely. That would be the case. And, and Stefan, that is, that is ESMA's approach, is it? We are looking at uh, the industry. Uh, but we also take into consideration the wider market environment in which uh, the investments actually take place. Um, also keeping in mind, uh, Debbie just said it, that there is a certain reliance uh, on banks uh, uh, and brokers in the market to actually be available in, in periods of distress. And of course, one of the questions market participants need to, uh, need to ask themselves is that realizing that this might not be the case especially considering the illiquidity of these markets at normal times, what does that mean for risk management of, of a money market fund? That's an important question. Thank you, Stefan. And David, just maybe just come back to you quickly uh, as an independent observer, listening to what Stefan has said and what Debbie has said, where are, are, you, are you confident? Are you feeling positive that, that the right outcome will result here? Confident the regulators will reach the right result? No, um, because I think there is like a built-in bias, particularly among the banking agencies against money funds that's been on display for 50 years since Chairman Volcker was at the Federal Reserve. And, and that is just keeps coming up and up. And, you know, my question back is if you blame this on the money funds, why were money markets unstable for the hundred years they existed before money funds? And post 2016, when the money funds, at least in the US, the prime funds shrunk by three quarters and their percentage in the money markets shrank by an approximately the same amount. And you have a similar thing pop up again. It, it, it isn't the money funds, it's the money markets that hit these periods. And that's why central banks, that's why the Federal Reserve System exists is to provide liquidity to the short-term markets in a crisis. That's why the Federal Reserve was formed in 1913. And they do a great job of it. I mean, I'm not criticizing them, but to, to blame that on the structure of money funds, I think it's just sort of missing that point. It's the markets. And, and Debbie, are you, are you worried about the, the consequences of, of, of mis uh, inappropriate regulation here? Is that, is that something that, that you worry about? You, you, you've mentioned that money market funds, their market share has declined. They're an important part of that market. It's an important market. Is, is, is the market at risk in some ways here? Well, I think the market is at risk in that if there's too much regulatory uh, change imposed on the credit sector, the, the, the crime sector of the marketplace, there is not enough yield spread then um, that would be obtainable from the market at that point uh, to differentiate between the government sector. And so uh, uh, essentially the money fund industry lives on, but would live on in a governmental sense only, which would withdraw basically the cheapest amount of funding available to most high quality short-term um, issuers in the commercial paper and CD market at this point. So yes, that does worry me to a large degree. Okay, well, listen, um, we're running out of time now. So, so thank you to all of our speakers. This is obviously a very complex market. It's a complex subject. It's good to hear that everybody sort of joining us today wants to engage in a constructive dialogue. Uh, we, we would encourage market participants, the industry regulators to, to read the ONFIF report, which as I say, you can download at onfif.org. 
Um, we think there will be obviously further discussion about this that ONFIF certainly plans to take part in. Uh, but for now, I'd like to thank all of our speakers today uh, and look forward to that constructive dialogue, hopefully having the right outcome for a very important industry. Thank you very much indeed for joining us.